Thank you all for coming. I'm Ann Stevens. I'm from the Department of Economics and direct the Center for Poverty Research on campus, which is a co-sponsor of this event. Um, I really appreciate you um, coming out this afternoon. It's, I realize we've got one day to go in the instructional part of the quarter, not that I'm counting, but it's a busy time of year and I really appreciate you coming. So we will very shortly uh, introduce our guests today that I'm really pleased to have join us. I'm going to briefly um, turn the microphone over to the uh, inspiration or namesake of this series on the public university and um, uh, welcome Provost Hexter to say a few words. Thank, thank you, Ann. You're, you're very kind. I, I want to welcome you all to the seventh and final event of the 2012-13 academic year in this series, the Provost Forums on the Public University and the Social Good. In case any, I've just given any of you a feeling of panic or sadness, be comforted that the Provost Forums will be, pick up again in the fall. Our 2013-14 calendar is being developed as I speak. Today, we're extremely pleased to have our, our distinguished speaker, Sarah Turner, University Professor of Economics and Education at the University of Virginia, and a research associate with the National Bureau of Economic Research. Professor Turner will speak on the topic, Faculty Labor Markets, Structural Challenges, and Cyclical Shocks. As those of you who have been attending the Provost Forums this year know, our speakers have come at our big subject, the future of the public university, from a variety of angles. This is how it should be, for discovering how we can best support the social good, viability, and essential character of the public university as a challenge with roots dispersed across the disciplinary spectrum. Topics that have received special emphasis this year include budgetary challenges, public university's public service mission, and the so-called privatization and corporatization of higher education. Also enriching this series has been the juxtaposition of many different perspectives, scholarly and practical, informational and activist, data-oriented and value-oriented, historical and economic, diagnostic and prognostic, and domestic international, among others. Sounds a little like Polonius. Um, today's forum promises to be an excellent culmination for this year's events as Professor Turner will take a big picture approach grounded in articulate economic and other types of data. More specifically, she will examine how the Great Recession has affected faculty hiring with an eye to possible threats to student attainment and research output in public institutions. In the best tradition of the social sciences and the field of education, she will leverage sophisticated research to illuminate issues at the heart of the public university enterprise. Before I surrender the podium, I'd like to tell you just a little about the history and purpose of this series. The very difficult period surrounding November November 18th, 2011, gave greater urgency to two questions that were already the subject of spirited dialogue and debate on the UC Davis campus. What should the University of California or any public university be in the 21st century, and what can it be? In response, the Office of the Chancellor and the Office of the Provost and Executive Vice Chancellor quickly committed to facilitating an inclusive and productive dialogue in the future of the public university. As part of this commitment, the two offices have established a web page residing on my website in support of lectures, panels, forums, and other campus events designed by or offered for the benefit of the UC Davis community. In addition, as a complement to other campus events, my office established the Provost Forum on the Public University and the Social Good. This focused scholarly series is aimed at furthering awareness and dialogue on this important topic within and beyond the university community. It's also aimed at exploring the potential to make UC Davis a center for the study of the role of the public university in its contemporary society. This year's seven public presentations have been overseen by my office in cooperation with the university's Center for Regional Change. To learn more about the Provost Forum, I invite you to consult the Future of the Public University page on my website. There you'll find a listing of all this year's events along with information, supplementary materials, and videos for all presentations, and in the fullness of time, the calendar for the 2013-14 Provost Forums. For making today's event possible, the following individuals and entities deserve great thanks. First and foremost, Professor Sarah Turner for traveling to our campus to share her research and insights. 
Next, our Oversight Committee for arranging this and the other forums for the 2012-13 academic year. The committee's members are Martin Kenny, David Campbell, Jonathan London, Luis Eduardo Gornitza, and Program Manager Alicia Thompson. The co-sponsors with my office of today's event, the Center for Poverty Research, the Community and Regional Development Program, and the Center for Regional Change. And Ann Stevens for serving as today's moderator. Moderator, excuse me. And for all of you for being here today, your participation in the forums is a key mechanism by which the series will help us identify and clarify issues facing public higher education and ultimately develop effective solutions. As I step away, I'll remind all of you that you're invited to stay for reception on the patio immediately following today's presentation. And now I yield the podium to Professor Stephens. I, I am back again very briefly. I just wanted to give a brief, uh, slightly more personal introduction to, um, to Professor Turner. Um, Sarah, there aren't actually that many people that I remember the exact day that I met them, but that oddly is true for Sarah, and it looks like she does too. So um, Sarah and I met many years ago when we were also both uh, at a great public university, uh, the University of Michigan, where we were doing our graduate work, and I met Sarah the day she came to check out the program to see if it was worthy of her attendance, and fortunately we must have made a good case, and, and she enrolled um, and um, has gone on from there. I, uh, I want to, um, you know, Sarah has moved on to do great things at the University of Virginia, and I, I've always sort of uh, admired Sarah for many reasons, but I think in thinking about why I was so excited to have her come today, um, Sarah is someone that has established through her work and her publications that she's someone with uh, great intellect and technical skill as an economist and expert on higher education, uh, but she's also someone who has a great deal of common sense and thinks about the real world, and um, I think most importantly, she is never afraid to use both of those and apply them to a variety of problems, which does not happen as maybe as often as we would like. Um, so with that, I will, um, I'm very happy to turn over the podium to Professor Sarah Turner. So thank you very much, Anne. It is really, um, a great pleasure and great fun to be here. Uh, I, I, I actually want to begin by thanking Anne, McCall, Hillary, the rest of the um, uh, others here who are old friends in the social sciences and economics in particular for inviting me to Davis. I, I've actually had two great days in which I've learned a lot about other people's research, which is fun. Uh, one of the things that really distinguishes the Davis group uh, from other, uh, other groups of economists and social sciences, scientists is that they're not only asking interesting questions, uh, but they demonstrate a lot of ingenuity uh, in figuring out how to find answers. So thinking about how to harvest big data sets and things like that. And the work that this group has done both in landing the Poverty Center and in building social sciences in general here is really uh, terrific. Uh, I will note that McCall has one of the finest databases in the, the country uh, on uh, students and labor market outcomes. So uh, there's a lot interesting that's going on here. Uh, so uh, when uh, Anne, Anne mentioned to me that uh, uh, Provost Hexter wanted to uh, encourage a conversation about the future of uh, uh, public universities, I figured this would be a pretty good opportunity uh, to, to try and really generate a thoughtful conversation. And I do hope we get to the conversation part uh, with, um, of course, an empirical uh, focus to it. So I want to really thank Provost Hexter for answer, for, for, for um, opening this forum to answer, uh, uh, answering questions about public, uh, particularly research universities. Uh, some people may know that we've had quite a conversation about public universities in Virginia. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think we, we, we you know, want to just set out some data uh, and think about both the constraints and the opportunities going forward. Now, I, I think when asked for a title, I set this up in terms of faculty labor markets. And I want to step back a notch. Uh, and really, I've picked a sort of more general title, because I don't think that you can think about 
faculty hiring or faculty salaries without considering uh, the overall context of the budget constraint for higher education. Uh, and so what we're going to do is a little bit of a walkthrough of what I think about as both the structural challenges and the cyclical challenges, both in higher education with a, a particular uh, focus on uh, public uh, uh, research universities and their plight, uh, uh, particularly with the, the Great Recession. Uh, ground rules are, are, well, we don't actually have them, I think, in typical economics uh, seminars. But if there are clarifying questions, I'm happy to take them uh, as we go along. And if they get out of control, I'll shut them down and, and we, can, we can move forward. Um, so what has happened to higher education and specifically public research universities in the wake of what uh, has been called uh, uh, the Great Recession? And I think what we see here is that the cyclical shocks uh, have very much highlighted what I'm going to call really uh, substantial structural challenges that have been building over the course of the last uh, 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 several decades. Uh, in some respects, the most recent recession starting in 2007 is, as Yogi Berra says, deja vu all over again. Uh, anyone who's been at a public university for more than a couple of years uh, has probably experienced a hiring freeze, some period of financial uh, crisis. You may have also then experienced the sort of ill-advised frenzy of trying to hire eight economists in a year or, uh, you know, the, the flip side of that. Um, you know, cyclical downturns in higher education have really non-trivial consequences for students and importantly the productivity of faculty. And I think, and they are, are, are I think, uh, I'm going to argue that the most recent cycle uh, has been particularly hard on public research universities. If you look back to the 70s, some would argue that cycles were particularly hard on private universities. Uh, and that's not just because of the the magnitude of the recession, but it's also because you've had a series of challenges, particularly declining state funding, uh, that have been uh, going on for a while. So we're going to do a little bit of warm up here. And I want to start again back to this point that this isn't the first downturn that public universities have experienced. And uh, my, my colleague, Bill Johnson, uh, Illust uh, wrote an op-ed back in 2003, which was another one of these downturns. Uh, at that time, he was uh, uh, discussing uh, 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 really some of the inefficiency of downturns. And I should note that Bill uh, served three tours of duty as chair of the economics department, and I think he had a, a recession in each one. But um, I think his, his basic message really applies across the board. And so you can probably, in some manner of speaking, substitute California in here for Virginia. Uh, 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 Speaking of UVA, he notes, this is a national treasure founded with dreams of academic greatness. It, it is also a state university subject to dictates and financial resources from the Commonwealth of, of Virginia. All of Virginia's higher education have suffered as the state budget lurched late in the 1990s to revenue shortfalls when the tech bubble burst. Uh, but to understand Virginia's particular situation, we have to look back to the 1960s when it was a good regional university with a fine law school, but not, not a national player. Then universities took advantage of strong state financial support to build some first-rate departments, uh, while private funding pushed uh, UVA's graduate school, particularly the, the business school, uh, to prominence. Uh, by the, the, the 1990s, U, UVA was part, uh, part of the way to becoming a top national university as measured by the strength of research and scholarship. Beginning with the recession and revenue shortfalls of the early 1990s, the university had lost the strong support of the state. Taxpayer funding in, in, uh, per in-state student stayed flat from 1993 to 2001. Uh, while its real buying power, as deflated by the CPI, fell about half since 1990. Um, it goes on, the more serious risk facing the university is that the academic gains made between 1960 and 1990 will slip away and it will gradually slide back to its former status as a, a good regional university. 
And Bill goes on, and I, I, I actually am quite fond of this quote. Greatness in a university is very difficult to attain and easy to lose. At, the, at, at bottom, as Jefferson knew, academic greatness require, requires recruiting and retaining top faculty members and providing them an environment in which to flourish. But highly cyc cyclical revenue sources mandating stop and go hiring po policies make it tough to maintain, let alone improve faculties, especially in the hard to hire fields, economics, uh, so <laughs> crucial for national prominence. Truly outstanding scholars are scarce and difficult to hire. Moreover, the best people are attracted to departments with able colleagues, so a department can collapse if a few leading faculty members leave. As Humpty Dumpty proved, it is hard to put the pieces back together again. So that is essentially my, uh, I'm, I'm afraid, long-winded introduction here. But I want to talk about, uh, just set forth what I'm going to call three structural challenges. Uh, and three of the cyclical challenges, and then go on and sort of uh, batter you with data for a little bit. Uh, so uh, three um, uh, 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 three structural challenges. Uh, so back in, I believe it was uh, the late 60s, Will Bommel, who's an IO economist, and Bill Bowen, who's a labor economist, and I'm going to call this uh, uh, Bowen's curse because Bill Bowen actually went on to uh, be head of Princeton University, uh, wrote a book about called The Economics of the Performing Arts. And one of the things that they, they uh, noted was essentially that in certain fields that are very labor intensive, costs are likely to increase far faster than the rate of inflation. So to take a particularly salient example, uh, while productivity gains have made it possible to assemble cars with only a tiny fraction of the labor that was once required, it still takes four musicians nine minutes to perform Beethoven's string quartet number four in C minor, just as it did in the 19th century. So higher education in the main has not, you know, uh, labor has become more expensive. We haven't in the main figured out a way to substitute capital for labor, which explains part of, I'm not going to say the whole thing, but part of increasing costs. Okay, so this is one of the structural challenges of higher education. We are very labor intensive. Second, for public universities, we've seen a long-term decline in state support for higher education. This is partly driven by the increased uh, commitments of entitlement funding, particularly Medicaid, that essentially crowds out uh, higher education and state budgets. Uh, and finally, I'm going to sort of make a, a, a nod to uh, the structure of our labor force. We don't, we don't, we have little capacity uh, to um, shrink our workforce. Our workforce, are, uh, it tends to be very predominantly tenured. Uh, we no longer, since 94, we don't have mandatory retirement. Uh, you may have noticed that universities expanded a lot in the early 1970s, which means that the age, for, uh, the age structure has become much older. These are structural challenges. These were, if you will, on the books before 2007. Okay. Cyclical challenges. And again, this isn't the first time that we've had a cyclical downturn here. We can, the, what we're going to see has happened before, but these two things are going to collide. Enrollment demand is counter-cyclical. Just about everything else declines in demand as we have uh, a cyclical contraction. But enrollment, uh, it, it, during periods of a high unemployment, the opportunity cost of time is lower. Uh, and it's, so long as students aren't dramatically credit constrained, we expect the demand for what we do to increase. Okay, so we have more people knocking at our doors. But then we have item number two, which is subsidy revenues from the state decline rapidly. There's a limit that you can cut if you're part of the state, state government, if you're getting a big chunk of resources from the state, uh, this means that you've got to do more with less. And finally, 
the higher education institutions, particularly public institutions, have limited capacity to do what we'd like them to do, which is to smooth uh, spending over time, uh, to borrow, to adjust for short-term constraints. So this is what I'm going to call, I think these are the sort of three pieces that the, we've got these structural problems, we've got these cyclical problems, what happens? What happens importantly for students in terms of affordability and quality of education? And then what happens to, again to faculty, which are both an input in terms of producing uh, student outcomes, but also the primary input in terms of producing that other big thing that distinguishes public uh, universities, which is research, research innovation, and so forth. Okay. So um, essentially where we're going is what, what actually has happened to us. Uh, officially, the Great Recession was over in 2009. Um, I, I think it lasted a little bit longer in uh, higher education. Uh, so let's, um, let's go to some numbers here, and then I want to talk a little bit about the implications for students and faculty, and then um, say some things that are probably not terribly well supported by data, but. Uh, uh, go forth and uh, uh, talk from there. So indeed, enrollment did increase really quite dramatically uh, during uh, the Great Recession, uh, from 18.2 million to 21 million between the fall of uh, 2007 and the fall of 2000, uh, uh, 2010. It's an increase of about 15.2%. Uh, this increase is both is pretty much spread across the age ranges. You're going to see a lot of uh, in a in a relative sense the biggest increase is going to be with people returning to school uh, after some time in the labor force. Some other statistics: women outnumbered men slightly in this increase in enrollment, but that's uh, to be expected. Uh, the increase in black and Hispanic students was pretty uh, substantial as well. That is, that this increase in enrollment really, as you look at the data in this recession, is not limited to a particular demographic. It's across age groups. It's across uh, race groups. It's actually also across income groups. Uh, so uh, one point which is, is actually very important is we've got a lot of evidence on the increase in the, the enrollment count. What we, we, if there's a, a, a graduate student looking for a dissertation topic, uh, the effect of the increase in enrollment on, of enrollment on college choice is a very important question that hasn't really been tackled very well. OK, some pictures. They're going to have a very common uh, theme to them. Uh, and again, what I'm trying to, 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 to get across here is this idea that uh, we've seen uh, this kind of cyclicality in enrollment before. So the w red is going to be the un unemployment rate. You're going to see this again. Uh, uh, and again, the little lines here indicate periods of recession. So people sort of maybe remember this period. Uh, and certainly remember this period in terms of uh, the unemployment rate. Now, what you can think is, for a lot of reasons, there's been a long-term trend in increasing enrollment. So it's hard to see year-to-year -year changes in this. But what I'm going to do is take out what I'm going to call the structural trend and look at the variations from the trend over here in the second panel. And what you're going to see is a pretty clear pattern, uh, sort of judge with your eye, uh, that this, this looks pretty cyclical. And I've got some numbers to, to uh, uh, illustrate the, the, the link we thought we did. Um, OK, here we go. Uh, for 18 to, to 20. So this is focusing on, these kids are looking really young these days. Uh, <laughs> I used to, uh, but for, uh, so think about this as, 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 as a first time college freshman. So essentially what we get from this, again, hopefully you can see that the lines track pretty clearly, is it an increase, in, if, you, if you look at the link here, an increase in the unemployment rate of five percentage points tends to be associated uh, with an increase uh, in uh, 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 enrollment of about 17%. Per 
uh, I'm sorry, it's about 12% for 18 to 19-year-olds. Uh, uh, it's a bit more, uh, so we see a little bit more relative cyclicality uh, for older workers. OK, so we do have this enrollment cyclicality. I don't think there's a, you know, sort of if you've been to a university, you, you, you recognize this. Where is it? So we have this big increase in, uh, in fall enrollment. So which institutions are taking the hit here? Uh, and there are two types of, actually, I think there are three numbers to point out here. So the percentages down here are the distribution across students across, uh, by, by institution type in fall 2007, the distribution of, of students across institution type in fall 2010. Again, uh, this is no big surprise, but the majority of four-year students are at public universities, okay? So we hear a lot of fascination about what's going on at Princeton or Stanford or, you know, small colleges, but they're, they're a tiny fraction of the, uh, they're even a tiny fraction of privates. Uh, so really the action in the higher education is in the public sector, uh, and it, it actually also tends to be in the public research universities in part because they're larger institutions. Uh, so, then this final column shows the allocation of the change across types of institutions. So about 20, uh, about uh, uh, more than a quarter of the change is, is being absorbed by public four-year institutions. What's surprising to people is the chunk uh, actually, you could think about dividing the four-year increment in an even bigger fraction of the four-year. The surprise is the growth of the for-profit institutions. Uh, you know, and then the other major player in this is, is community colleges. And McCall will be coming up at some point to tell you about, uh, uh, about community colleges. But again, public four-year institutions are a big piece of this change. Okay. Uh, California actually faced some enrollment caps, so you see actually less. You see, you see Davis actually takes a, a pretty uh, non-trivial increase in, in enrollment here. The Cal State system is a, a conversation unto itself in terms of constrained resources, but, uh, but again, has it, you know, ha, is this specific to everybody but UC Davis? No, it's not. Okay, we need a budget constraint here. Okay, so we're going to think about, I'm going to make it reasonably uh, easy to, to think about this in terms of we've got, uh, we've got expenses on the top side of, uh, of the equal side, and then how do you pay for it uh, on the other side, okay? Uh, so if we have more students, we're going to think about resources per student, right? as the sum of expenditures per student divided by the number of students. So if we've got more students, we need to increase our expenditures if we're going to keep that the same. OK, so the big chunk here is faculty wages, which are someplace on the order of 70%. We've got other stuff here, uh, plant equipment, uh, some support services. But we're going to think about faculty wages as the big ticket item in terms of expenses. OK. So how are we going to pay for this? How are people going to pay for this? One, we've got fee-for-service, tuition revenues. Uh, and we're going to think about net tuition revenues here, which is going to be uh, uh, the, um, uh, uh, the tuition charge less institutional financial aid, uh, federal grants, state appropriations, private gifts, and investment income. Okay? If you're a public university, you care a lot about this, and it's going down, OK? Um, and so what does that mean? It, either you have to reduce the amount that you're spending, you, either you have to reduce expenditures, or you've got to increase one of these other entries here. And so uh, again, we're going to think a little bit, uh, and again, for, there are two ways to think about net prices and net costs. There's for the university, which is posted tuition minus institutional aid. And then there's this question that is most salient for students, which is, post is net price uh, essentially posted tuition minus the external grants and, and federal aid. And again, I, you know, if I haven't said it uh, uh, 
uh, already, I want to make this point, which is one of the sort of salient missions of a public research university is providing opportunity. It's as a, 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 an, an engine of opportunity. So this question of affordability is key. OK. So appropriations, uh, overall constant dollar state appropriations to higher education fell 17% from 2007 to 2011 from 87.7 billion to 72.5 billion. Uh, visible here, uh, again, uh, the red line, uh, which, and this is a little bit of an exact, it sort of makes us look a, a little bit different than, uh, we've got the red line and the green line corresponding uh, to the right axis. Uh, and then you can think about this in terms of a long-term trend in state appropriations per student, which if you drew a line from here to here, it would be sloping down in any, or drew a line from here to here, it would slope down anyway. You've got little cycles in there, but it's gonna, it's gonna, it's on a downward trajectory and it's going down even more. Okay, and it's going sort of, there's a little bit of a, a sort of accounting trick here in that the appropriate, sort of talking about the aggregate decline in appropriations per student is combining, you've got this expanding denominator with much of the expansion of students uh, occurring at community colleges which spend less per student uh, than four-year universities. But nonetheless, you've got declining appropriations per student. You can see it on a state level. I believe California, actually we don't have the most recent data for California. Uh, California is hit. Uh, there are other states that are actually hit worse. Florida, uh, Nevada gets creamed, Arizona gets creamed uh, as well. Uh, I think that this is, uh, this is the numbers from the UC system that I think show the magnitude of the hit in the four-year universities and the difference in the relative hit between the, ca the, the, uh, the Cal State system, which in terms of, uh, of dollars uh, is smaller and probably rebounds more, uh, and then the UC system where you, you see this sort of massive uh, uh, hit and, and yeah, it's, it's sloped up, but you're not, you know, uh, you're not back to where you you uh, uh, you started. So let's go. Let's. So one of those elements in our budget constraint has declined a lot. What are, what's going to? Uh, I, I guess one of the points here is is again. This isn't, again, the first time that we've been to this, the, this event. So this is not actually a surprise. That is, if you look over the whole period of time, uh, you do find that increases in the uh, unemployment rate are historically associated with decreases in appropriations. And what's, again, a little bit different about this cycle is the magnitude of the downtick. Uh, so it's, it's the biggest increase in unemployment. Uh, so that is partly the, the you know, again, this, sh this wasn't a surprise that state universities were going to get hit. And again, it's not going to be a surprise that institutions are going to be forced uh, to raise their tuition. Just a sidebar, again, because I'm going to spend a bit of time on the private-public university comparison as we go forward. If you're a private university, either those that live in Palo Alto or in Cambridge, Massachusetts. You, were, you too were devastated, but for a very short period of time, okay? And indeed, it was the private institutions that were the most endowment dependent, so um, our, our friends uh, at Harvard, uh, that actually took the biggest short-term budget hit. But their pain was pretty short-lived. Okay, so this is a total rate of return on endowments. You have a really bad year, uh, and then things actually start looking up again. So there is this distinction between the public universities and the private universities in the duration of the shock. Uh, and that is going to be very important as we think about resources per student and as we think about uh, uh, faculty uh, hiring and so forth. Okay.
So I sort of should have a, a, a chalkboard to keep score of my budget constraint here. Uh, but we've got other things that are going on so that the news isn't uh, entirely bad. Uh, the federal government did engage in stabilization through uh, the AAR, ARRA funding, which provided some relief that was passed through, it would pass through relief to the states as well as uh, additional research funding. Uh, a big piece of this that is uh, worth pointing out and turns to, uh, turns to be very important is the increased generosity of uh, Pell Grant aid. Uh, as well as uh, uh, as well as uh, uh, tax credits during this period. So between 2007 and 2010, there's a dramatic increase in the generosity of the federal Pell Grant, rising from 4,400 uh, to 5,500, and also you see a big increase in the number of Pell Grant recipients. And one of the things that distinguishes this recession from the 1980s recession is that in the 1980s recession, the Pell Grant actually lost real value, so lost purchasing power. Whereas at least in this recession, uh, the Pell Grant, which is the primary form of need-based grant aid for low-income students, actually became more generous. OK, so there is at least one positive tick in uh, this, uh, this little accounting framework here. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on it, uh, but if you think about the total, again, low-income students also not only benefited from the increased generosity of the Pell Grants, but also benefited from increased generosity in tuition tax credits, which essentially moved from this little red line up to this line and moved from this line uh, to this line for middle income students. So uh, about $2,500 for middle income students up from about $1,750 per year. So there is, there is some, there, there is a fair amount of federal relief, mostly targeted at low income students, but a little bit of relief for, for moderate income students. Uh, okay. Um, so essentially, right, going back, I guess this is my accounting slide, going back to the overall university budget constraint, you've got uh, essentially uh, three choices, right? Reduce expense, oops, reduce, um, if I slip to the end of this, it's going to be devastating because it, uh, essentially you can reduce uh, expand, expenditures on facu faculty, which means either slowing growth in wages or reducing the number hired. You can reduce subsidy per student, which we think actually has potentially real outcome or real consequences for student completion, or you can raise tuition. Those are your choices. There are, you know, so borrowing and lending is off the table, essentially, best I understand public university budgeting. That is, you can only borrow for capital projects. Uh, so what are the basic effects? We're going to talk about affordability and quality first, and then we're going to talk a little bit about what we see in terms of what universities did in terms of faculty hiring, faculty labor markets. OK, so the, the piece of this that uh, I think is uh, well recounted in much dialogue is the increase in tuition. We have to use two separate axes. Uh, the blue line is for private universities here. Uh, the red line is for public four-year universities. And whatever the color this is, it's really an ugly color, is uh, public uh, two-year institutions. Now, the real story, people have been complaining about this line going up for, for decades now. And, and actually, the big increases that, that have been most dramatic were really in this, this period. Uh, but the, the story uh, and the concern is driven by the increase in, in particularly public uh, tuition. The increases in, in tuition at public institutions were sharp, uh, rising 10% uh, for, uh, for both two-year and four-year institutions uh, and have continued at public institutions well above uh, the rate of inflation, about 6.7% in the last two years uh, for public four-year institutions and a bit less uh, 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 for uh, two-year institutions. Let's see, is there anything? Um, 
But this isn't really the story that we should be focusing on, OK? It's this story that, that we should be focusing on, which is the change in the net price. So, uh, and this is even not my favorite picture. Um, we're going to get to my, my more favored pictures here in a moment. But we don't want, the, the public really shouldn't be focusing on just this increase. What matters is the change in the net price. I think one point that people just haven't realized is that the net price of attending a two-year college has actually gone down on average in the US over the course of the last five years. And you may be confused by how, come I ha how do I have a negative number here. This is because the Pell Grant and the associate other, uh, associated other grant aid is actually greater than uh, the tuition charged by these institutions. Now, this is not to say it's, it's easy to attend these institutions, uh, but the net price has gone down. Not so easy uh, with, uh, with the public four-year institutions. And again, you should see that things have been actually pretty flat at the private sector here. They've held the line. So, but what, the, the pictures that we really want to look at are the pictures of net cost by family. Uh, oh, I should, uh, and, and this is actually the really quite dramatic increase in tuition at the California schools. I don't think this is a surprise to anybody, but you're going to see this in the next slide, that California is among a handful of states in which I think there's a four-year tuition increase of about 60% at the public flagship institutions uh, in terms of the sticker price, less at the, at the, the other institutions. OK, yes, OK, so my slides are just a notch out of order. Uh, again, not surprisingly, this is the, the states that changed in-state flagship tuition the most are going to be the states, there's an upward slope to this arrangement, the states uh, with the biggest hits to their economies, but there are also a set of states, I would call this a nonlinear relationship that shouldn't surprise you. Um, 2007 to 2011 change in resident tuition. I've che it looks a little bit bigger because it's not constant dollar. Uh, but again, you've got California, Arizona, Georgia, Florida, Washington states that are all primarily really hit by uh, uh, the erosion in property values. Uh, but again, California is in this group. It's what the data shows. And so this puts us in this question of what's the implication for net cost? And here, I'm going to start with the, the, the Virginia case, because I actually know the numbers well and believe them. Uh, so essentially, this is this question of, of how do, how do, what is the difference in cost of attendance for different types of institutions? And one point that is going to become just blindingly clear in the next slide is a point that Carolyn Hoxby and I have made in other research, which is if you're an extraordinarily high achieving student and you're low income, attending a very selective, very high-priced institution is actually going to be cheaper for you than attending certainly a non-selective public institution and, in some states, uh, attending uh, the state flagship institution. And I want to make a point that Ann and I have been discussing on the side, which is that the demographics of Virginia are just simply very different than the demographics of California, which lead to um, the capacity to, to, frankly, to fund a different model of financial aid. But essentially, uh, Virginia instituted, actually, back in 2003, a program called Access UVA, guaranteeing no loans for students less than uh, 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 with, with income less than 40,000. Uh, question. So this is actually the two, this particular picture. Good question. OK, always failing to explain uh, axes here. So this particular picture is for in-state students at uh, uh, in-state students, students from the state of Virginia. 
okay? Uh, and it is just undergraduate students. Um, I actually, you know, the, the question of graduate student tuition is, is very complicated, but actually worth, uh, worth taking a look at because the, at issue is who pays, students or, or uh, uh, the, the government or institutions in the form of, of TAs. But, but the Virginia story is pretty clear. And net cost in Virginia, sort of this is the most recent year, we managed to hold the line. Uh, things look pretty good if you're low income. We see something that is that economists aren't real keen on, which is a sharp notch here at 40,000, uh, or a little less than 40,000. Uh, uh, so Virginia is the red line. You have an upward sloping profile in terms of net cost. You, so UVA isn't going to cost you $10,000 until you hit uh, essentially 40,000 in family income. Uh, one line to make this clear, this is Duke. So again, holding true to form, Duke is actually less expensive for much of the way up this until you become very affluent. Uh, so this is essentially a net cost picture. And the real question and it's a question in Virginia, it's a question in uh, California as well, which is how have these profiles changed with the Great Recession? So it's not just what is the average net cost, but what is the average net cost across uh, the distribution? And importantly, a point that I'm going to come back to in a bit is do we communicate this net cost clearly to students? Okay, uh, because so I wrote a bit of Java code to scrape this from uh, the net cost calculators. I'm expecting that not every undergraduate does that when they're trying to um, compare. Uh, uh, actually, I had a graduate student do this, which is even uh, even more like cheating. Uh, so this is the picture in um, in 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 California. And this is, a, and I think if I'd been really on top of this, I'd figure out how to compare years across time. Uh, so this is again sort of speaking to Hoxby and Turner. The ugly colored line down here is Stanford. Okay, uh, Stanford has a net cost that is below that of either the UC system or the CSU system at very low levels of family income. Okay. And as you see, the line sort of trends up uh, both and sort of stays sort of close. Uh, UCs and, and CSUs, at least based on our running of the net cost calculator data, are pretty similar in cost until you get to 50,000. And then, uh, then you see a divergence in net cost because this is the point where you, you hit the essentially the, the paying full cost in, in the CSU system. The, the big question for the extent to which uh, uh, the UC system and public universities in general are able to meet, uh, uh, are able to provide opportunities to students is how have these profiles shifted over time and to what extent does the shift in the profile, particularly in this middle income range or the lower middle income range, how does that affect students' decisions? Uh, to invest in higher education. Now, the anecdote that goes with this that hopefully we can talk a moment about is that um, several PhDs uh, in economics who study this actually spent a little bit of time debating today about whether those are really the uh, net cost numbers uh, uh, for, uh, for, for the UC system. So if we can't figure it out, it may be the case that, that uh, students uh, have a hard time figuring this out. OK, so uh, again, um, point to take away is that if you've missed the memo, we have shifted from the state paying for public, high, public research, public university education to students paying for public research university education. Back down here in the 1980s, uh, students paid about a quarter of the bill. Today, students are paying 43%. Uh, and I don't see this line turning around uh, anytime soon. Uh, again, so takeaways from sort of this part of the discussion, and I'm, I'm uh, I guess, oh, I know where that slide is. Uh, we've seen a, a shift in who pays from uh, the state to individuals, which is only partially compensated by the increase in federal aid. Uh, 
we see an increase in, in what I'm going to call, you missed a slide. Uh, it's got to come back here someday soon. Um, oh, we're going to see an increase in stratification and resources by type of institution. So resources per student, as you're going to see in a little bit at the community colleges, to some extent at the open access four-year institutions, are actually going to decline. Uh, in research that I've done with uh, John Bound and some other folks, I think we've made a pretty persuasive case that resources do tie to your likelihood of completion. Uh, and indeed, I think there's some pretty good evidence that suggests that they tie to later life outcomes uh, as well. Um, we'll find that slide. Implications, so I think the open questions are going to be uh, uh, the implications for opportunity for low income students and the consequences in terms of completion uh, for stagnant, uh, uh, stagnant resources per student. Okay, I want to shift uh, to talking for, for a bit about faculty labor markets because this is, just the, this is the other piece of the expenditure puzzle here. Uh, and faculty labor markets um, have been obviously subject to two, two challenges in the, the Great Recession. The first is what I'm going to call inefficient unilateral policies. There is nothing that an economist sort of thinks to be probably less efficient than a furlough policy. Um, uh, you know, a, um, a, a high, an across-the-board hiring freeze or salary freeze is probably next in line. Uh, but again, given the budget constraint, we're going to also think about uh, employment outcomes. And again, what are the consequences uh, for students for research? Uh, okay. Uh, again, just some peculiarities of uh, uh, the uh, uh, faculty labor market is that we don't adjust very quickly. Uh, the minimum unit of time when uh, discussing, uh, uh, discussing hiring is a year. That's the minimum. Uh, uh, it takes a really long time to produce new PhDs. Uh, I think it's a little bit less than that in, in the sciences, but what this means is that our whole infrastructure for flows into academics adjust very slowly and you're going to often have a, these sharp uh, cycles produce uh, actually a very wasteful mismatch between the flow of new graduate students and the availability of positions. And then we have uh, this observation that we've got a lot of people that have contracts without term. Okay, again, just uh, in case you, you know, we've got a long list of these things, but uh, the UC system is certainly not alone in terms of pay freezes, uh, system-wide furloughs, uh, Indiana, Penn State, Rutgers, uh, uh, UVA is down here with the faculty freeze, Wisconsin had a furlough as well, have instituted these policies. Again, you can, some of these policies have been brought about by state legislators. legislatures. Some of them have actually been the choices of college administrators. Uh, but what they fail to do is to, is to actually engage a conversation about resource allocation and, and often uh, it lead to um, uh, they, well, they fail to, 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 to big inefficiencies in the allocation of faculty uh, across departments. Another sort of, there are many policies, but again, uh, we can think about them. Okay. Um, let's go, let's first think about hiring. And what I'm going to, so we're going to do the same pictures uh, in, in, in multiple forms here. Uh, the first is, is, so the red lines are going to be public. Uh, the uh, black lines are going to be private universities. We're going to start with all colleges and universities, and then I'm going to focus on a smaller set of pretty selective research universities. And not surprisingly, the scales between just the, the, the size of a public university tends to be larger than the size of a private university. So what we're going to do is to index these things so you you should think about 19, uh, 2007 is going to be the base year.
year, and you can read off. So this would be a 6% increase, actually, in the number of full professors at private universities. And this looks like something less about stagnant in terms of the number of full professors at public universities. Actually, associate professors continue to rise. I attribute this, uh, you know, basically you're looking at the middle part of the pipeline, uh, and there's not much going on there for both types of institutions. Now, here's where the action is. Um, this is hiring of... Uh, of assistant professors, sort of new blood into the profession at research universities. You see um, private, and this is just all universities. I think these are going to get worse. Uh, so you see, you see that things, things are, are, they go up a little bit uh, in terms of number of new assistant professors uh, at, at private universities, and they fall like a rock at uh, public universities. Now remember, this is occurring in an era in which you have enrollments increasing, okay? Uh, instructor positions you can think about as temporary support. If you've, again, uh, economics is gonna be different than everybody else here in terms of the number of jobs posted, but if you're in uh, if you look at job postings for assistant professors, this is the total number of jobs posted in English between 2007 uh, and 2009. You see a fall of more than 400. Uh, ditto for foreign languages. Again, you're going to see uh, a, you know, a really uh, dramatic fall in the number of new job openings. We still see a decline from 2007 uh, to the present in economics, it's just not, not quite as sharp. And actually, if we look at, at programs with PhD programs, it looks pretty level. Uh, uh, again, uh, if we look just at new hires, looking at AAU institutions only, uh, at the departmental level, the probability of a new hire uh, we're going to, the AAU data is the only data we have in which we can actually see a uh, field of study. It's, uh, um, but the AAU folks are, are reluctant to see individual universities listed. Again, you see this dramatic difference between the public sector, and, uh, the, uh, the publics are the, the big declines and the privates and the probability of new hires. Uh, research universities, again, research universities in, in uh, uh, full professors actually decline uh, in number at research universities. And again, you see this, look at the magnitude of this drop at research universities, okay? You're dropping from essentially 15 percentage points uh, in hiring of young faculty at research universities, which I, I, I mean, I, I have a sense that uh, it's the population. Yes. So, uh, I mean, if you think about the new flow into this, it's even more dramatic. So, uh, again, this is from the AAUP numbers. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, we have nice text here, but we'll, we'll skip this. Salaries. Few people have, maybe, maybe the news was better in terms of salaries. It's not. Um, uh, so things look pretty good if you're a full professor. I mean, no, you probably wanted an increase uh, greater than 3% on average over this era. But if you think about sort of, again, these are constant dollar. You've seen an erosion of faculty salaries in real terms at public research universities. Uh, again, you see an increase in assistant professor salaries uh, at private universities uh, and what looks like not much going on uh, at public research universities. And now what really matters right, which is resources per student. So take our student numbers, divide by our faculty numbers, and you see what's going on at the public research universities. That is, you see uh, really this quite dramatic increase 
in student faculty ratios. Scott, question. Uh, this includes um, this includes tenure and tenure track faculty, so it's not actually including adjuncts. Um, there was an adjunct, uh, an instructor slide a while back. Um, the sort of sidebar on this is institutions do a very bad job of measuring adjuncts in part because they're they tend not to be employed on full time. Contracts. So again, you can think about if, in fact, public institutions hired a ton of adjuncts, it would narrow this gap. Uh, but there is also, you know, a, a, a question of, of again, this is just a very crude indicator of resources per student. But the, you want to think about these faculty numbers as not as as affecting two parts of the university production function. They're affecting both the resources available to students, both undergraduate and graduate, uh, to provide instruction, but they're also impacting the, the if you will, the, the primary input to doing research at universities. And if you think about young faculty as being sort of the key to future growth, you've basically decimated a, a, an entire cohort at many public universities by the reductions in hiring. Um, okay, so McCall is, is telling me to get to the point here. Um, uh, okay, uh, so resources per student. Um, you, you, again, on the faculty side, we've seen uh, a, a decline. We've also seen a widening, I think stratification matters. We want healthy competition between public universities and private universities. Uh, I think we've seen, I think we've seen a demonstration of, of increases in stratification uh, on this front. Uh, I want to, to point, uh, uh, to think a little bit about this rookie market uh, for PhDs. Uh, I think that, that the employment effects have been particularly concentrated among new, uh, new, new hires. I think this, uh, this leaves you know, real questions about what the prospects for faculty are. Shirley at Tillman at Princeton has, has uh, said quite a bit about this. She notes the thing that will have the, the longest term negative impact on colleges and universities is if we can't figure out how to continue the careers of young people just coming out of graduate school. So again, this is a, a, big, a big challenge and we ought to be very concerned about it. Uh, and then I think senior hires and mobility. I think the data that I've shown you underestimate uh, the challenges in this market. So my hypothesis, which is why I have a question mark here, uh, because I don't have the data uh, to, uh, to, to prove it uh, with the types of, uh, 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 with the certainty uh, that I would like, is that essentially what has happened in this downturn is that private universities, once they got through the first hiccup of the recession, went shopping at public universities. Uh, and they went shopping for talent. They didn't pull from the middle of the distribution at public universities, but they pulled superstars and people on star-like trajectories. Uh, and I think this is a question uh, that, again, you know, to what extent have the very rigid policies that have been in place at uh, many public institutions limited their capacity to compete? Uh, and again, I think that there's a, another question that's in the back of my mind, which is given that public institutions have been so constrained during this period, basically the only people who have, who have uh, gotten raises are people who can demonstrate mobility. Does this differentially affect some groups? And I'm going to just put a question mark on that and keep, keep moving. Um, OK, so what do we do about this? Uh, and I think that, that uh, this is where, um, you know, I think public universities find themselves really caught in the struggle between reducing costs and trying to maintain affordability while also hitting that mark of excellence through staffing and resource provision. Uh, 
And I think that the combination of the structural, ch structural challenges and the, the cycles of the recession put public universities very much at risk of losing some, some real greatness here. And I don't have a clear solution, but I have, I guess, a couple of ideas. And I see sort of really two primary margins for adjustment. Um, and I think the first point is just that public universities uh, really need to think about changing how they do business. Uh, Provost Hexter said that the first lesson he used when he got here was actually his lesson from uh, running a private institution. Uh, but I think that playing defense uh, is really not a viable strategy in terms of weathering this storm. Um, uh, quoting from Chuck Vest, our universities are society's premier agents of change, but they're also extremely cautious and slow. Uh, so they're slow to change. There are two margins we can hit. One is external. Uh, and I think uh, public universities are too often uh, portrayed as villains in the public dialogue. Uh, you know, you see the really tough talk from politicians, just let me pick one statement, Obama in 2012 in Ann Arbor, let me put colleges and universities on notice. If you can't stop tuition from, grow, from going up, the funding from taxpayers will go down. Um, if you haven't sort of seen the budget constraint, uh, it, you know, it doesn't work. That if, if the funding from taxpayers goes down, uh, the, the, the tuition's either going to go up or quality's going to go down. Uh, my colleague Sandy Baum and Mike McPherson note the anger and resentment expressed toward college leaders appears to be growing despite limited ability of those leaders to make college cheaper quickly without lowering quality in ways that will uh, uh, disappoint the same people that, decry, uh, uh, that, that cry about higher pr prices. Um, so I think, you know, sort of where are we with this? Uh, we need to make uh, clear the public, uh, the role of public universities in mobility and innovation, sort of not apologize for stating that, uh, make salient the link between institutional resources, public support, and excellence. Frankly, make really transparent uh, the link between tuition, financial aid, and net college costs. Uh, and advocate for public policies that give public universities the capacity to smooth cycles uh, going forward. So that's the sort of external bit here. Um, I think that there are also some internal uh, changes. Uh, we budget, you, you know, we, we hire on long cycles, but we budget really year to year. Um, we, you know, we, we think in, in year long uh, increments. It's plain that some uh, we need to think over a longer period of time. Uh, some academic units are growing uh, faster than others. Uh, times change. We need to not think in terms of unilateral increases or decreases in resources. Uh, indeed, uh, I think this gets to the, uh, I, I'm reminded of a story of, uh, there's a very well-endowed professorship at N M MIT. It's a professorship in welding. Um, institutions must change. Uh, they do change. I believe that that has been converted into a professorship in material science. But holding on to positions just because they were relevant at one point doesn't make much sense. And university leaders need to think about closing things, combining things in addition uh, to uh, my notes, uh, adding a center, a vice provost, an associate dean, an interdisciplinary program, uh, or other uh, uh, potential add-ons here, as, as important as, as those things may be. Um, I also want to think about, uh, <laughs> yeah, well, it's hard to do. I mean, and, and that's actually part of the, the Q&A point. So let me actually, because we should have a little Q&A. And, and um, I mean, I think my final point is that, again, if you're going to be more, pro, if you're going to, if you're going to take reform seriously, you've got to encourage academic units uh, to uh, uh, essentially plan and take responsibility for planning. I get to read the little, little bit from our own external review point that I think really uh, captures the challenges of most departments pretty clearly. 
uh, and I think transcends uh, uh, one department. Given the recent stop and go history of hiring and retention, the administration and the department are currently stuck in a bad equilibrium. The department does not believe that the administration is committed to retention and growth in, uh, in a way that is realistic about the challenges of hiring in an academic market. The skepticism necessarily implies little payoff to the department in terms of thinking long term. So planning occurs on a year to year basis to fill the most urgent needs. For its part, the administration is no doubt nervous about making substantial multi-year commitments uh, in the absence of a shared strategic plan or a cohesive plan. We think that there is only one way out of this dilemma. Uh, administration, the administration can signal its seriousness by committing to a multi-year financial plan that is realistic about the costs of rebuilding or replanning uh, and forcing each department to internalize the costs of doing business. Um, I think these are challenges we can meet. Um, so, uh, questions. Uh, enough of me. Uh, thoughts, uh, thoughts about uh, 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 public universities here? Yeah. yeah. You were talking about this earlier, this idea of better articulating the public value and purpose of the university. And we were talking about the fact that that's a little tricky to do because some of the people you're aiming out at may not be on board with the idea of social mobility from the very bottom up. So do you have any thoughts or have you seen an example of a university that does that successfully? I have not seen an example of a university that does that successfully, but I will lean on the, the Theta Scotch Pole no notion of targeting within universality, which is this idea that um, you think about many social programs that are actually reasonably well liked. That is, they may have a redistributive component, but they give a little something to at least everybody going up the distribution as far as the median voter. So one, uh, one issue here is it's both a real issue in terms of affordability, uh, but it's also the political issue in terms of how you, f you frame it. That is, that is need-based aid if you can do it. And right now the issue is the, there, isn't the, there aren't the resources in the most university budget constraints. But you can think about making clear that as an investment proposition, kids in the middle are benefiting too. Um, but I think it's a real trick here. Um, Um, I have it on from my inside source at UVA. I believe it was the dean of graduate studies or maybe the president of the school in a talk to graduate students said that she predicts that the idea of kind of tenure as we know it might not exist in 15 to 20 years. Do you see that as potentially a way that the universities will use to be a little more flexible and solve these problems or will we maybe be able to get tenure? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, I think that that's, so I, I mean, I, you know, again, I think that, that I, I think, you know, there, I think that the universities are going to end up exploring new contracting arrangements with faculty. I don't think that you should look at it as am I going, I am going to necessarily be worse off if I have a contracting arrangement that is not a contract without term. Uh, I think, you know, obviously we can, we can have a long discussion about the benefits of tenure for academic freedom, but there also are also limits to academic, f or what academic freedom implies about choices within the university. Uh, so academic freedom really doesn't actually, uh, in any way. Um, I think there are going to be new contracting models, and I think that, you know, again, we, I haven't touched on the issue of, of um, you know, are we going to have disruptive technological change in higher education? And if you, if you think about any version of that, you as a potential faculty member probably want a different type of contract than I have. <laughs> Scott. A couple of thoughts on uh, two. Uh, one is the rate of return or the benefits of going to college. I think we could tout those more. And, and the second is, some of your other research, time to degree. I think we, your figures were all in annual tuition costs, but the time to degree probably risen about a year, I think, from reading some of your work. 
Uh, yes. So that so the, sort of the net cost of it, uh, obtaining a degree has risen probably uh, even greater than. So if I was writing, you know, promotional materials for either UVA or one of the UC schools, um, what I would do would be exactly what you suggest, which is to try to give a sense of not just the near-term tuition cost, but the long-term benefit in terms of, again, you know, paying, again, you know, $12,000 a year as sort of tuition in-state for four years and getting another year in the labor force is going to leave you much better off than a situation in which you're going to college for five or six years and um, missing a year in the labor force. And, you know, again, we have it, you know, can we make that story salient? You know, uh, and the hard piece is, you know, McCall's got the data to do this right now, but is actually showing uh, the earnings of, of students from different institutions. Was I not supposed to? Oh, okay, Scott, yeah, you, you, <laughs> um, you know, but again, sort of giving this picture of Earnings. Now, the heart, you know, uh, politically, um, something that a third party can do, but I, I'm suspecting that the chancellor of the university is not going to want to sign their name to, is actually a chart that shows that the CSU graduation rate is 32%, something like that, and the UC Davis graduation rate is. 78 percent, and then it, you know, sort of showing the difference in earnings. Be, you know, I mean that. I mean that's really, you know, that is information that 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 students need to know in making choices. And the real concern about how students making are, are making choices is that they are making choices without full information about net costs, uh, without information about future returns and with misperceptions about both their likelihood of graduation, time to degree, and future earnings. Um, a couple of questions that are pretty numbers oriented. So near the beginning, uh, you said that the um, <coughs> faculty labor costs were like 70% uh, of what really is my question. Uh, uh, 70% of instructional expenditures yeah. is, is the denominator. So probably what you meant, but that's a hard number to get. So my first question was, how do you actually get that number in a reliable way? Um, I'm not going to sort of pretend that it's incredibly reliable, but uh, it is um, pulled from, I will tell you mechanically how I calculated it, uh, which is pulling total instructional expenditures by type of institution uh, from, so this is not including hospitals, auxiliary expenditures, uh, things like that, and then pulling the salaries and wages of faculty, uh, um, again, from, he from the IPEDS tabulations. And uh, I'm not going to, I, 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 I'm not going to bet my life on the numbers, but uh, 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 I think it's a, I, I, I certainly will, will stick to the fact that labor is the biggest input here. Okay. Well, I'll, I think there's problems in this with separating the research part out. Yes, I, I but the yeah. But then that, that leads into what my real question is. So that you also showed that the, um, number at least of full professors, which are the ones most highly paid, and their salaries uh, were not going up. And you <laughs> kind of alluded in the beginning to that a problem with higher education that it's labor intensive and and has fixed and has large rising so-called fixed costs. And University of California OP, they claim something like four or six percent a year or something like that. So if faculty salaries are not going up and the number are not number of faculty are not going up, why are costs going up so much? Uh, so, uh, so I, 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 um, I actually don't know that, that uh, I haven't looked at the cost, the real cost numbers at the UC system. My guess is that, that, that instructional costs per student are pretty flat, if not declining, uh, over the last 
over the most recent period. Now, that isn't to say that there aren't other costs that are going up. Both student support services go up uh, and have been going up uh, over the last decade. Um, you know, I think that there are other costs. The cost of technology are a big piece of university budgets, and you know, uh, subscriptions to the library uh, are a you know again are sort of big pieces of the university that are uh, that have not uh, had much cost containment uh, uh, over time. Hillary. We know the elasticity is there, but yes. do, we have, do we have a sort of macro picture on what the elite publics are losing in the, in the lower family income part of the distribution that indeed they are fleeing or moving on a, at a higher or low rate to the elite privates that are providing such expansions over the last, say, 10 years? Sure. Well, I mean, one way to, to, to get at this is to look at you know the enrollment numbers of low-income students at the elite privates, and they've gone up, but not by nearly the amount that you would, you, frankly, you would hope to see them go up. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the, um, we can we can go through the bonus slides, but it'll take me longer longer to get there. But I, you know, so think think at the very top, so kids in the top top uh, decile of the achievement distribution, uh, there are about forty thousand low income students. There are about five thousand of those students who show up at the top. Uh, essentially the top 150 uh, institutions. And frankly, you know, again, we have these conversations about, you know, gee, isn't it, you know, is, isn't Stan, you know, Stanford or Princeton lovely, but Stanford and Princeton are really, you could take all of the elite private research universities together and they are smaller in terms of students served than you know, half of the public universities in California, you know. So uh, again, you shouldn't, uh, you know, they, they are, uh, the, the elite privates frankly don't, you know, e even if you had, even if they, they had a much greater rate of increase, don't have the capacity to uh, accept all of the students who are um, high achieving and low income. very labor intensive and it's hard for us to improve our productivity. But I think productivity has improved. I think in research, having access to computers, easy journal access and so on, I think we are more productive as researchers. In teaching, I think having <coughs> textbooks that didn't exist 30, 40 years ago has made it easier to teach a large number of students, to have instructors come in and do what faculty do. And then of course, come, so the, the problem is it's difficult to measure what our productivity are. And the big thing that we are now all looking at is these uh, massive online courses. Right? And that's going to be very tempting to the state government and administrators. Well, the state government, government. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the sort of tech technology is the sort of elephant in the room here. At the same time, you know, I mean, UVA has is a MOOC participant through Coursera. I'm not sure if, if the California schools are or not. There are two problems with, I mean, it, it is an experiment at this juncture for everyone. And you, there are two, I, I'm not worried about my day job uh, based on Coursera yet for two reasons. There's no revenue model attached to it. And the bigger piece of it is that there's no way to evaluate student learning, student, uh, student outcomes out of in, in, any, uh, in, in any reliable way that you could pass on to a labor market out of these systems yet. So the idea that you, you, you would give a real UC Davis or Stanford credit to somebody who you don't even, you know, it, um, without verification at this point, we, ha we haven't solved that problem yet. So it, I see this as a, 
it, it's an experiment. But to your first point, I'm not going to doubt the point that, that, that there have been productivity increases and we haven't measured them. But in terms of actually, I'd like to think that, that our students are learning at a different frontier, particularly at research universities. And indeed, that justifies, you know, sort of uh, part of the existence. That is that they're seeing, you know, cool new stuff that Hillary and Anne are doing. And, uh, it, it, you know, um, but I think it is very difficult to, to, to measure uh, uh, in terms of just how we, you know, again, the, 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 um, the, the technology we use in teaching is uh, at best, you know, 1920s, right? I was going to wrap it up. That's sort of an unfortunate note to end. Oh, no, but please don't end not, in fact, we, In fact, I won't end this, but um, I want to invite everyone, after we thank Sarah, to stay and enjoy the reception and continue this conversation. Thank you, Sarah. This has been fun.